Being in the stunning Surrey Hills, surrounded by lush greenery, is a powerful reminder that we are part of something much greater than ourselves. Nature operates in a cycle of birth, life and inevitably death, one of life's few certainties. Talking about certain subjects can be challenging, especially when it comes to the subject of death. It's often considered taboo with the belief that just mentioning it might quicken our demise. But what if we could have open conversations about death? What if we could share our thoughts with those closest to us and discover the options available when making decisions? Having a better understanding could help us overcome any fears and questions we have but have never had the opportunity to explore. Join us, Annalise and Luna from Whistle Stop Arts, as we meet professionals from the end of life sector and learn how making conscious choices can positively impact the environment. Simon Farrar, founder of Clandon Wood Natural Burial Ground, isn't afraid to address the topic of death, as is evident from his attire. I'm intrigued. Let's find out about what inspired him to create such a wonderful place and hear about the special event he's hosting today. I went to my aunt's funeral, which was a natural burial very early days, uh, no, not many people had actually heard of natural burial back then, I certainly hadn't. It was in the beautiful Worcestershire countryside and she had this beautiful willow basket and it was a day very much like today, beautiful sunshine, uh, but it was in November and I just thought why don't we do funerals this way and it literally was that feeling that four years later I found the land here at Clandon Wood. We're having an event called Come To My Funeral and it's for people that have never been to a natural burial ground or don't understand the difference between natural burial and a conventional burial. It's for people that have attended a burial, perhaps in a conventional cemetery and kind of got freaked out by it and their fear started then about burial, dying, death. Um, so today I want to show people that there's a kinder way, a more gentle way, a kinder way of caring for our dead, a more gentle way of caring for our living, um, and also a very gentle way of, of how we care for our dead, but also look after the planet as well. What a great idea to offer a non-funeral funeral for people to experience what a natural burial might look like. And to see what a shroud can look like, it was so much softer than I expected. And I was pleased to see that it was a fake body and not Simon under there. Other great initiatives are being set up to explore end of life choices and help us all better understand our options. We met with Mandy from the Brigitte Trust. So the Brigitte Trust is a Surrey based charity. Um, we were set up 40 years ago, it's our 40th anniversary year this year, um, in order to provide uh, practical, emotional and social support for people who've been given a life-changing diagnosis. Death cafes are quite a new thing for us. Um, we decided that alongside our core work of providing the support to individuals, we thought it would be um, a sensible move to provide more of a group support for people. So death cafes um, were set up to allow people to be in an in a informal environment to discuss death, dying, end of life, grief, bereavement, Coffin Club is a series of events um, where people can come and learn more about end of life. So it's a series of talks over the course of six to eight weeks where people can come and hear from a funeral director, a solicitor, um, someone who does natural funerals, maybe someone who is more on the spiritual side, which is called a soul midwife or a death doula. And it's a wonderful opportunity to get together with like-minded people, have a cup of tea, piece of cake, and learn a bit more about end of life. Coffin Club was launched in the UK by the two Kates, lovely celebrants in Hastings. So we started off as funeral celebrants, um, and within a couple of funerals, we were we sort of turned to each other and said, is this what you would want for your loved one? Is this it? And Kate T had read about Coffin Club New Zealand. We went to all our local funeral directors and said to them, uh, because we'd been to lots and loads of beautiful venues, 
is perhaps uh, the local hotel or the village hall or a barn, is that somewhere where you perhaps think that your clients would like to hold a funeral? And they said, no. We were like, oh, why, why is that then? And they said, well, they've never asked. So that sort of put fire in our belly that they didn't know, you know, they hadn't asked because they didn't know that there was all these different venues, all these different places that they could hold their celebration of life. There are no rules. You can do anything as long as in the final instance you dispose of the body correctly, which in this country is burial, cremation, burial at sea, or aquamation is legal, but um, I don't think there's any way It's bubbling, doing isn't it, it but not quite yeah. yet. You know, the two things tie together. The way we work as celebrants is to offer a broader range of support and um, encourage people to know their options, encourage people to take ownership to whatever degree they're comfortable with. So, and this guy um, actually came to Coffin Club and I know he won't mind me using his name, so he was called George, and he was lovely, wasn't he? Yeah. And he came quite a few years ago, six or seven years ago, I think, and he decorated his coffin with his daughter, and he had worked in the print works at the Daily Express, mainly, other, some other newspapers, mainly the Express, so they had covered it all with newspaper, and they put this way up and handle with care, and I think it had been really meaningful for her to do that with him. And he'd left quite simple instructions. He said, I want just, a, you know, a single slot at the crematorium. Um, and what he had said was, I don't want any of my family pool bearing because they'll probably drop me because they're so clumsy. <laughs> Which they then overruled him and they did carry him. Um, but the little personal touches that they added were just really meaningful. So for a start, he was always effing and jeffing. So I said, um, are you happy for me to swear within the service? And they said, well, Kate, actually it's compulsory. <laughs> Attending a coffin club is not only informative, but it's also an opportunity to bring friends and family together and unleash our creativity. Who leads your funeral is entirely up to you. It could be a faith leader or it could be a friend, or you might like a celebrant like Kate or Kate or Helen who led Simon's funeral. I am a celebrant and that means for me is bearing witness to life, celebrating the evidence of love but as a task, it's supporting the transition from people being in mourning to then a lifetime relationship with grief. I had this adoring widow who was just as in love with his wife as the day they met. And they met in school, I think, when they were 13, and they were 80, so he'd never known adult life without her. And obviously I was like, <sighs> Um, and he was talking about her and how they met and all this and you could see the passion and they loved dancing and we were chatting and he said oh, I'd love to dance her out and I was like we can and he was like can we and I was like yeah and I was speaking to his great niece and because when we had the family meeting the people that wanted to contribute came to the family meeting and then we heard all that and then he he left and I said to the grand niece would you be up for dancing him out with her and she was like 100 percent so we did the ceremony and then when i said you know please stand we're now going to take her down to her final resting place but we are going to dance her out to their song lady in red and the niece came out in a red dress it was so lovely and she got him and they danced her out and that was about five years ago but it still gets me because it was magical and he was just as in love as he was the day he met her <laughs> it was beautiful and I love that. I love that people can die how they lived. And if you were passionate about your lifestyle and passionate about your life choices, take it to the grave. Don't just take it to the last breath, take it to the grave. And I help people do that and it's amazing. <sighs> When someone dies, one of the first people you might speak to is an undertaker, someone who undertakes your wishes, also known as a funeral director. 
The wonderful Judith at Dandelion Farewells explains what happens when someone visits her and her team. Our time spent with a family or individuals as they come to arrange a funeral is in our, our lounge here and quite deliberately there's coffee and you know, refreshments and there's a, a visitor's loo and just very practical things that we hope will make this feel a more homely space. And then the double doors lead into what we refer to as our, um, our family lounge where perhaps others might call that the chapel of rest and it's a very adaptable space the area where people come to be alongside the person who we're looking after. We can also um, have some chairs within here, have a small ceremony. Um, perhaps if people don't want to attend the crematorium but they want to be here and say goodbye from here, there's lots of flexibility in this room. And there's also another set of double doors that then lead into what we refer to as our care room but may also be formally called a mortuary. And when we describe that space to people, we explain it looks a little bit like the nurse's room at the doctor's surgery. And within our space here, we have modern proficient refrigeration. So the information's already there and often people have already seen that on our website and that's, that's why they're choosing us. Although having an undertaker is not a requirement, you might find their knowledge and support really helpful. Knowing what they offer and their approach in advance can give great peace of mind and help the process go smoothly when the time comes. My famous saying is we start with a blank sheet of paper, we don't have arrangement forms as such. Uh, we just sit and listen to, to families, sort of what they want to do, and we try and keep it personal at all times. I mean, yeah, we've, we've done uh, funerals here when families say, oh, is it all right to have a drink at the graveside? And they go, yeah, what did, the, what did that person, oh, they love champagne. And we've had tables out here and we've had all the glasses and, and we, we poured all the champagne out and we've toasted that person. And that's really, really important. And another lady here, um, she was 91. And I got, she was sort of a bit of a character and I'm talking to her and we had Eddie the horse here with, with his cart. She said, I haven't ridden on one of those since I was a child. I went, do you want to ride on, on the cart? She went, can I? I said, yeah, because you can. And just as, she, as they walked away, she was waving and that really set the whole tone for the, for the ceremony on that day because uh, she was waving and she was smiling. It was her sister's burial here. Um, but that was lovely, it was just small things and it's not, it's not about spending lots of money on different items, it's all about just the small things that, that just make a difference and make it personal. But we always say to our clients, you know, it's a celebration of life, it's your day, you choose your options, what you require. You know, we don't tell families, they've got to have that package and that's all they're left with. We are big fans of funeral planning, but not funeral plans. So the conversation for me is about trying to unpick some of these options before it feels very, very painful and difficult. And we have some sort of, there's a coffin masterclass, there's a crematorium masterclass, there's lots of information we can share with people. And it's always going to be a balance to not overwhelm somebody, but to give them all the options because it would just be very disappointing for all if in six months time after the funeral, they were to make a comparison about the arrangements they made for their person with another funeral they went to and they said, I didn't know that was possible. Having an undertaker support can be very reassuring, especially when there is so much to consider, including all the legal elements. When there's been a death, you'll need to register it with the local registrar. A deal can help us understand the process. We will create that death registration and we will take time with the family to go through all of those details to make sure that every detail they've given us is accurate and correct. Um, any small mistake can lead to a, a complicated and costly correction process and we don't want any family to have to go through that. And because these are legal records, we need to make sure that actually they are recorded legally and, and, and correctly to begin with. Um, so we will create the legal record um, and from that legal record we create a number of forms. So you, you commonly uh, hear of a form which is called a green form and that's the form that's used for burial or cremation. So whatever the family decide to do and they don't have to decide at that point, they can go away with that form and then make a decision as to what they wish to do. Um, and one of the other most important documents is the actual death certificate 
because they will need that to notify relevant authorities that their loved one has passed away. So, so in terms of supporting um, families, we do support faith deaths, but equally there are deaths that occur um, that the family is of no faith, but they have um, whatever particular reason for an early release or, or speed. Um, some of those occasions are when families wish to donate the body for medical science. There's a, a, an essence of speed behind that. Um, the body must be donated within X amount of days. Um, so from a Surrey County Council perspective, absolutely, as soon as we're made aware that there's a time critical um, death that we need to act uh, quickly within um, our teams are ready and from a personal perspective the work that I do within the community is predominantly around the Muslim faith but it's not limited to so if anyone was to contact me you know from from another faith that actually needed some support around the whole process in terms of the logistical uh, side of, of death registrations and you know, dealing with coroners or cemeteries um, myself and, and my colleagues out in the community we wouldn't hesitate to support them. Adil spoke about supporting communities and kindly invited us to the beautiful Shah Jahan Mosque to meet other people involved in end of life care. First, Mohammed tells us more about the mosque and its significance in the community. So the Shah Jahan Mosque is the first purpose-built mosque in Britain. It was built in 1889 um, by a linguist who was born in Budapest in Hungary, um, Dr. Leitner. It was designed by a local Christian architect called William Chambers, who was from Guildford. The design is based on mainly Indian architecture, and it was funded by the Begum of Bhopal Princess Shah Jahan, who paid for the mosque to be built. And it was completed in the year 1889, so it's 135 years old, and it's the first purpose-built mosque in Britain. So the Muslim community in Woking is about 10%. So there's about 10,000 Muslims in Woking. Uh, it's a very tight-knit community. Uh, it's a very well-integrated community. The mosque has been around for a very long time. So it's naturally attracted wider members of the community who are not Muslim because of its history and heritage um, to come and visit, to come and have a look. It's also a community hub. So we do activities like sports activities, fundraisers, uh, community car washes. So it's really open door policy and it gives people an opportunity to come in and get to know each other, learn about different faiths and cultures. And I think the mo mosque has played a pivotal role uh, in helping communities come together uh, and celebrate the diverse history and heritage of Great Britain. So the Shah Jahan Mosque has three buildings on site. So we have the old historical mosque that we're sitting inside now. We have the praying halls, uh, which are the large rectangular buildings, which are old warehouses that were converted in the 90s to prayer halls. They accommodate the bulk of our worshippers. So at full capacity, we can accommodate 2,000 worshippers. Uh, then we have the library building, uh, which was a museum and a publishing house. A lot of the time people will call a religious figure just because it brings some sort of comfort to them. Uh, not that there's a particular need for that, but Islamically, but just brings comfort and solace to the family and the loved ones around them. So when somebody passes away, uh, we ask that those who are around, that are around the individual, they recite Qur'an, so verses of the Qur'an are read. In particular, there's a certain chapter which is called Surah Yasin, that should be read around the deceased. Then we would close their eyes. Uh, and first thing that we do, if there's quite formal process that has to take place, we would loosen the limbs to make sure that the limbs, this is in that when we come to the washing, that it's easier to move the body around. So the general principle that we have as Muslims when it comes to dealing with somebody who's passed away is that we deal with them in a manner that you would deal with them as though they were alive. So yes, when the person has passed on, we have to wash the body, but the water has to be the same. For example, water has to be the same temperature as though they were alive, so you can't wash them in scalding water that's too hot or really cold water. So the water has to be just the right temperature as though the temperature you would have a shower in. And the same way when we handle the body in terms of moving for washing, you need to move the body over side to side, it has to be done gently and not you know, throwing the body across. So the general principle we say is that the way that if the person was alive and you would treat them, you have to treat that body that's now, there's no soul in that body, you have to treat it in the same manner. And we believe that that body is something that's God's created and it returns to the ground, which because it belongs to God, it doesn't, my body here, I, my soul is my soul, but my body belongs to God. And so it will return to the ground 
uh, from what it was created and the soul then moves on to the next stage of its life. Ninety percent of the burials here at Brookwood Cemetery. So you do the visit, you locate the plot, then you help fill in the documents and the forms for Brookwood Cemetery. So that's one part of the process, the documentation. Um, then we have to organise the wash. We put the message out. First, we always ask the family members, have you got anybody who wants to? And most of the time, yes. It's quite a lot of the times, depending on the size of the family, not always that everybody wants to do it. But I kind of encourage them because, um, and, and it's, it's always happened after the event, once they've done it, because they never get this chance again. But we have to be prepared. It doesn't matter your age, it's going to happen and you could die young or you can die old. What I mainly do is deal with the cemeteries, the coroners, like day to day, the emails back and forth, uh, booking in with the cemeteries, arranging collections from the mortuaries, homes, hospices, uh, and just dealing with the paperwork side of things. And obviously the speed everything happens at, you could get a call in the morning and obviously with faith burials it needs to be either the same day or next day. So you get a call at 10 o'clock in the morning, could be buried if, if we get everything in on time by 2 o'clock the same day. So the speed is 10 times quicker, you have to work 10 times quicker. Mm -hmm. Especially if we need to build a shroud box, you've got to go to the local timber merchants, buy all the materials, cut the box to correct size, take it to the cemetery. All, all whilst everything else is happening in the background at the same time. God's told us we're made of uh, clay and water. So we go back to nature. So uh, we don't tend to, do, unless it's wet or the cemetery says you have to, we don't tend to bury in uh, coffins. So the, the, the deceased will go in and we'll just put an artificial box, a more stronger box that goes over the top just to protect it from when the dirt comes on. Hamid discussed the Muslim belief that humans were made from clay and water and returned to the earth after death. And whatever our belief is, it does emphasise the importance of making thoughtful choices about our end of life arrangements, what's best for ourselves, for other humans, animals and our glorious planet. So Clandon Wood is a 31 acre wild flower meadow. It's actually called Clandon Wood because I was going to originally cover, cover it with trees. But the more research I did, it became evident that I needed more of a diverse landscape for a nature reserve. So we moved the new native trees to the perimeter. We sowed the rest of the land with wildflowers and wild grasses, and we put in two ponds and wetlands. We've now recorded nearly a thousand different varieties of plants and wildlife growing, living, breeding, feeding uh, here at Clandon Wood. That's the other difference with natural burial is that the graves are only three foot six inches deep. They're a single depth grave. The fact that it's a shallow burial means there's more aerobic content in the soil and you get more ready biodegradation. We don't use any plastics. Um, we don't use any plastic metal handles. We definitely don't do embalming. Um, purely for the fact it's better for the environment. And I've seen a huge change in, in our profession uh, and we're now going to a more greener, uh, environmentally friendly type of funeral and this sits really well here at uh, Clandon Wood. We do use a lot of willow coffins these days and they're extremely popular and I tend to use English willow, uh, mainly from Somerset where most of the willow is grown in the UK. Um, we have the opportunity, if families want to, to go help weave that and it's a lovely experience. So I've been growing natural flowers on our chalky soil uh, and uh, making sure that we have beautiful chemical free flowers for everybody locally. I truly believe in, in recycling. Our flowers are all compostable so they can go on the heap at the bottom of the garden and be used to grow more flowers. Uh, but I love it when I'm told that the flowers that we've created have been taken apart and handed out to people. Um, it really helps to, to know how they're going to remember that person. What a great idea to have local flowers. Then afterwards you can grow the same in your garden. We've heard a lot about what happens after we die, but what about before that? Who provides support for us at the end of life? In a hospice or hospital, there will be people available to support us, but who else is there to offer help and comfort? 
We're visiting Krista in her gorgeous garden on the river to tell us all about her role as a sole midwife. We also get to enjoy her granddaughter's baking and receive a very warm welcome from Krista's dog. Now I know lots of people hear the word sole midwife and think, hmm, what's that all about? Um, so the easiest way to describe it is that sole midwives provide care and comfort and support for anyone coming towards the end of life and also for their families and friends and carers. It's holistic care and comfort and support, so non-medical, non-religious, there's no kind of faith base at all. We have a really deep understanding of the stages of the dying process. Uh, so what happens as someone goes through their dying time uh, and we understand that there are physical and emotional and psycho-spiritual aspects that go alongside of those. Um, and for each of the stages of, of dying, those aspects will change slightly. There's a lovely universality about those stages and about those aspects. And yet at the same time, every single person's death is completely unique. We use age old skills, really simple but really powerful things that support the dying person as they progress through their dying time. Things like sound and including the sound of our own voice, how to use the voice. We use oils, sacred oils. We use colour. We use breathing techniques. We use meditation and visualizations and going on little journeys. All of these techniques that help to create and hold a really calm space where the person who's going through their dying time is the most important person of all. We've forgotten how to be with people as they go through their dying time. And it's become something which is alien to us. So we don't know what to do. And the biggest part of the role of a soul midwife, I think, is facilitating, unlocking those age old skills in us all. It's kind of unlocking the heart. So uh, it's not that the soul midwife is the only one who can do all of this. We can all do it. We can all do this. The soul midwife is there to guide and support, really creating a very, very strong bond with the person who's going through their dying time, but also supporting those around so that we're all able to do that thing of walking someone home, supporting someone, loving them all the way through their dying time and, and beyond really. But there's a midwife as you come into the world and a soul midwife as you leave the world. As well as different jobs that support people at the end of their lives, there are opportunities to volunteer and make a difference to the people in our communities. Organisations and charities like the Brigitte Trust have volunteer programmes where people can be trained to support those with a terminal diagnosis. Well, obviously the first thing is to get to know them because Sarah very kindly gives you a quick brief guide of what they're like. So you go in knowing a few facts about them. And the way, because I'm new, is try and deal with it, I go into the client so I can start off with what I know about them, then try and find out what happened in their life. Because the clients I've had so far have been rather elderly, so they have a vast life. And you can try and talk about that life, usual things like what did you do, where were you born, what's your family, and generally just get them to trust you, because that's the most important thing. Another guy, um, I went to work in his house and he was quite angry and I was just talking to him, I said, what's the matter? And he'd just been diagnosed with a few weeks left. And he asked if I could stay in while he phones his kids, you know, and I, it, yeah. And um, that was strange, I mean, that was a pleasant thing to do, to help him to be there. And I thought, something's got to be done, I must be able to do something. And I don't know how it happened, I either Googled or it came through on my job search site, something, it, I, I was, I thought, well, who are they? So I had to look for, I'll have a go at that, and uh, that was it. If someone asked me, do you think I should become a, a volunteer? I would say, um, I think you would make a lovely volunteer, 
be prepared to learn perhaps a lot more about yourself than you already know. It can be rather frightening, but it's also very life affirming. Volunteers come from all parts of the community. You only need a few hours a week to make a big difference in someone's life. Hearing from all these great people sharing their experiences about death and dying really has highlighted to me how much there is to know. And there are lots of areas we haven't had time to explore. Making a will, what cremation entails, donating our bodies to science. And I definitely want to know more about aquamation. If you're interested in finding out more, find a death cafe or coffin club in your area. We can't avoid death, but we can be better prepared and reduce the stigma surrounding it. Let's give the final word to our experts and hear their top tips. Talking is my top tip. My top tip would be to not shut it down, to be open. Even if for you, you might not want to talk about your own mortality, but if your loved one, even the grandchild might say, you're gonna die soon, Nan, like they do, don't shut it down. Just say, well, we all do. We just never know where. Research your local funeral directors. Most people still do use a funeral director. You don't have to, but most people still do because, you know, we need that support. So look around, research them, find out the one that is actually right for you because they're different. So make sure you find the one that's right for you. Use seasonal flowers because then they will always be there to celebrate that person at that time of year. Be informed before the need arises as much as possible. Ring, fence some money and put it away for your funeral because it is going to happen. Write it down so you're planning ahead. To listen with the heart and to talk to each other, to communicate. We extend our sincere gratitude to everyone who contributed to this film, which is part of the Shrouded in Silence project and was made possible by our generous supporters and funders.